this morning, uh, Pastor Rachel is going to share. And Rachel has been with us for several years now, and she is uh, blossoming. She's just continued to be a blessing to our kids. She is a blessing to our staff, and she's going to bless you today, whether you're here or you're tuning in online. And uh, she is, has grown. I've seen her uh, over the last several years. Uh, she has developed into really a young lady that is passionate. And when I first met you, uh, you were passionate about kids and missions. And I said, man, if those are the two things you're most passionate about, you're going to fit on this team. And so she, she came on board, and then she just really uh, found, her, found her gear, and she's really, really doing a great job. Um, the last thing I'll say about Rachel is that uh, Rachel, uh, she is a phenomenal racquetball player. And if anyone wants to play racquetball with Rachel, not pickleball, racquetball. I just lost my train of thought, and so I went to racquetball. Look, there's a squirrel. By the way, did you see the praying mantis outside? There were several out there this morning, all wanting to get into church. So anyway, I lost my train of thought. I, I, I totally missed it. But anyway, we love you, Rachel. First service, she crushed it. And uh, really some great insights. I got a page full of notes, and one in particular thing that I'm going to talk with you after about uh, that really meant, meant something to me. And so anyway, without further ado, I'm going to give it to you so you get out, done on time. We love you, Rachel. Let's hear it for Rachel Nellis. Hey, friends. Um, so first of all, if it's your first time here, please go online to the contact page. Tell us you're here. Also, if it's your first time, as you just realized, Pastor Ben is the lead pastor. I am not. If I totally butcher this, come back next week. He'll fix it. It's going to be really great. Um, but also, if I do really well, you know that he picks good leaders. So win-win. Make sure to come back next week. Um, that being said, we should probably start. So I am going to start by revealing two of my biggest fears. First biggest fear is accidentally falling off of the pier while riding my bicycle. Um, some people say it's irrational. I feel like that literally could happen, um, especially I love to ride my bike with my headphones in. Um, I have to bring my car keys so that I can get back into my apartment. I usually have my phone. So basically all the things that I, all of my possessions that I care about are with me. So if I were to fall, my bicycle would be gone forever. I would be in the water, my phone, my keys, my favorite earbuds. It, like, also super embarrassing. Anyways, I was riding my bike downtown Grand Haven yesterday, and my tire caught the cement wrong. I was like, this is it. This is, I am living my biggest fear. I'm about to fall into the water, lose all of my things, also be very embarrassed. Um, and I managed to regain control of my bicycle. I continued going. I was embarrassed, but I did not fall off my bike, and I did not end in the pier. So I said, okay, cool. I can conquer fears. My other biggest fear is reading in public. And because I conquered my bicycle fear, um, I am going to conquer my reading in public fear, and we're just going to jump right into it. I'm going to read some scripture. It's going to be really fun and really great, and I might mess up on some words, but that's cool. So we are, as Pastor Ben mentioned, we are in Mark. We have these cool Mark journals. I believe we still have some, so if you are like, I would love to journal through scripture with our church, go grab one. Um, go ask for one. Don't go grab one, because I don't know where they are. But you could go to the Connection Center. We will hook you up. But it goes through Mark and then gives you space to journal about it. Um, we are on page 44 if you're using this. Um, if you're in your regular Bible, I would assume it's probably in the, like, thousands. Um, but we are looking at the ESV, and we're going to start at, in chapter 7, verse 24. And it says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered, the, entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, one-handed page turn, because I can't do a headset, it's too much hair. Um, immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and fell at his feet, fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast a demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the bread, to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table, under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this, 
statement, you may go your, go your way, the demon has left your daughter, and she went home and found her child laying in bed, and the demon gone. So this is a super weird story, um, lots of things going on, and I just want to ask, this is probably a question for like the husbands, or even just the men in the room who love to tell stories, but sometimes forget details. How many of you guys have been um, you're really excited about the story, you start it, um, you think you're doing a good job, you're not missing anything that's not important, um, and then all of a sudden someone joins into your conversation who was there and says, well, actually, it happened this way, and then this happened, also you forgot this detail, um, actually, that part didn't even happen, you're not even telling the right story, and then all of a sudden, someone else is telling your story, you were really excited about it, but you can just be happy that it's being told correctly um, and that the people listening are getting the full experience of this story. Like some of us have been there. If you've never been there, maybe you tell too long of stories. That is the boat that I'm in. I usually am the one who tells a million details, doesn't even remember what I'm talking about. Uh, so hopefully we don't do that today. Anyways, we see this kind of situation happening with Mark and Matthew. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call the synoptic gospels, meaning they have a lot of overlap and the same stories in them. Um, and this same story that I just read is also in Matthew, um, but there are some important details that Mark leaves out, which is intentional to his gospel, but for the sake of the story, we're going to look at the Matthew version. So in chapter 15, verse 22, where is where we see the same story, and it says, a Canaanite woman from the region a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon, but he did not answer her a word. I want you to imagine with me for a second, maybe um, you are a kid who is in Gateway Kids. Imagine I'm sitting on the stage with Pastor Ben and Pastor Bobby and Pastor Drew, and something crazy just happened back in Gateway Kids because all of us were in here and no one was supervising the children. You run in, say, Jimmy broke his arm. We don't know what to do. He's bleeding out. We're freaking out. We don't know how to fix this situation. Imagine I just stared at you. Like, you would get panicky. You would be like, I, like, I, don't, I literally am not capable of helping. It would be a scary situation if I literally did not respond. And that's what Jesus does initially. He does not answer her. So she just came to him crying, Jesus, my daughter needs you. There needs to be an intervention. And Jesus didn't answer her. Um, in an effort to stay relevant, I spent a lot of time uh, like asking my 16-year-old sister, like, what's cool, what's trendy? Keep me up to date so that the kids think I'm cool. Um, and she explained this term to me. It's called getting left on red. And not the color red, but like, I read that. And what it means is when you send a message to someone, they open it, you can see that they opened it, and then they don't respond. So essentially, Jesus left this woman on red. He did not respond to her. She knew that he heard him because she was literally looking at him. It is a weird situation. Um, so this is the first big thing I see in the story is that this woman comes to Jesus and gets ignored. And what a terrible feeling. Not only that, we're going to jump back into the story. Um, and the second half of verse 23, it says, And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. And I don't know about you guys, but if I was in that situation, I would have loved to just say, Peter, nobody asked you. No one was crying out after you. This woman was here for Jesus, not you. Um, but I think that that might be a little bit besides the point. Um, but I feel like we can relate. Anyways, we're not here for Peter. Um, we see this woman getting rejected by essentially the people of the church. And I am confident that if I pass this microphone around, we could all share a story of rejection. And I'm going to share one. Let me just promise you that I have worked through this. I am confident in who I am. But sixth grade Rachel, this was a traumatic experience. Um, that was a rough stage of life. I am so glad there's not a whole lot of like photo evidence of sixth grade Rachel. She was incredibly uncomfortable. Um, but anyways, I was taking guitar lessons and even just that, like I do not have any musical ability. I do not have rhythm. Um, I have to like, if we're clapping, I have to watch. Um, today I watched Ariane. I was just like, okay, clap the same time she claps. Don't clap when she doesn't clap. 
and I can't even like sing and clap at the same time. And also I'm a really loud clapper. So like, don't mess this up. So much pressure. But anyways, there I was in guitar practice, um, trying my best to be a musician, and we just, it didn't work out. But anyways, on my way home from guitar practice, we stopped at McDonald's, and I was headed to the bathroom because I drink a lot of water and I have a really small bladder, and sixth grade Rachel, trying not to be noticed, just walks to the bathroom, and there's these two girls, probably a few years older than me, at um, a booth, and one of them says, hey, she wants to be your friend. I was like, that, that, what? Like, that's a weird thing to say to a stranger. And before I could even start figuring out, like, how in the world would I be this person's friend, the other girl chimes in and says, no, I don't. She's ugly. I was like, oh, my gosh, that was really mean. I'm just going to go to the bathroom, pretend that didn't happen, maybe talk about it 20 years later in a sermon. Um, anyways, we, rejection is, like, traumatic. It scars us. We remember it. So here we are in this story, we see this woman has been ignored and now rejected, and you think, it couldn't get any worse. And then we see Jesus answer this woman, we think, okay, cool, Jesus is showing up, he's going to set these disciples straight, he's going to tell them, stop being a Pharisee, uh, we don't do that, we love and accept, but this is what Jesus says. The scripture says, he answered, I was sent only for the lost sheep of, this, of the house of Israel, but she came and knelt at his feet, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And you guys might be like me listening to this story and thinking, what is Jesus trying to say? I don't really see what's happening. Um, the disciples didn't really see what was happening. The Pharisees were really bad at seeing what Jesus was trying to say. Um, so I'm just going to tell you guys what Jesus is trying to say. Jesus just called this woman a dog. We see Jesus compares the children in this story to the Israelites, the Jews, um, and then the dogs to the Gentiles. And, like, I really had to wrestle with this. Like, what? That doesn't sound like something Jesus would say. Maybe I'm missing something about God's character. And then I had to remember, this is a different time in the big story of God's redemptive plan. Before Jesus died on the cross, he came first for the Jews and then the Gentiles. Not the Jews or the Gentiles, or the Jews and the Gentiles all at the same time, but the Jews and then the Gentiles. And luckily for us, we are in the and then the Gentiles stage where um, it's not hard to get to Jesus. He is readily available to every single one of us. Um, but that was, is what was going on. And a lot of commentators had a hard time with this one. Um, so they're like, Jesus called this lady a dog. That, that What? Um, and some of them are like, okay, well, let's look at the Greek, see what's going on. And they're like, okay, well, he used the word for little dog or for pet dog. But ladies, how many of you guys in this room, if someone called you a dog, and like, but little dog or pet dog, you're more of a chihuahua than a pit bull. Like, the dog is a dog. Um, so here we see Jesus entering into the situation after she has been ignored and rejected. And instead of welcoming her in, she is now ignored, rejected, and insulted. Like, it is literally crazy. Sorry, I did my notes in a different order this time. Okay, found my spot. Um, but she did not give up. Here's what happens next. In chapter 27, she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Even after being ignored, rejected, and insulted, she is still pushing. And I think partly because she was fighting for someone who couldn't fight for themselves. Her daughter was not able to get to Jesus, and she was willing to do whatever it took to see healing and deliverance in that situation. Jesus literally told her no, and she kept pushing. If Jesus told me no, I'd be like, oh, sorry, Lord, sorry I bothered you. Fine. Um, but that was not her attitude. In the next chapter, in chapter, uh, in verse 28, we see, Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So here are a few really important things that we see in this story. First, like I explained, this woman understood the parable that Jesus was using. She understood that when he said children and dogs, he meant Jews and Gentiles, and she knew her role in that story. And she was content with that. She was willing to be a dog if it meant that it was in relation to Jesus. 
Not only that, but this is the first and only time we see Jesus heal someone from a distance. Like, Jesus wasn't physically there with this daughter, and she was still healed. And I think it was because of this woman's faith. And one of the most important things we see is this is the only time in the, chap- in the book of Mark that we see someone call Jesus Lord. I was reading through some commentaries and stumbled across this line. It says, she placed herself unconditionally under Jesus' lordship. This is the faith which alone is capable of receiving a miracle. Understanding Jesus' role as Lord is so important. Um, I am super, super relationally driven. I love to um, relate. I fairly often will just refer to people as friend. Um, One time someone was like, sounds a little kind of culty, but I promise it's not. I just really enjoy being friends and in community. And I have seen that overlap in my relationship with God. And sometimes I find myself being a little bit too casual with Jesus. I'm like, hey, Lord, uh, here's what's going on. Are you going to fix this situation? Um, But when we don't understand Jesus as Lord, we limit what he's able to do in our lives. Um, And it requires submitting and being humble. And that is exactly what this woman did. She knelt down at the feet of Jesus, was willing to recognize him as Lord, Um, and because of that, something incredible happened. But when I think about the story, when I see myself in her shoes, I don't know if I would have been able to do what she did. How did this woman push through being ignored, rejected, and insulted? I can handle being ignored. Um, I'm kind of a pushy person, so if you don't respond to me, I probably will just ask the question again. Um, And I'm pretty direct, I'm working on that, trying to be a little bit more tactful, but I can handle being ignored. Um, But when it comes to being, like, rejected, when you, like, physically tell me, no, you are not welcome, I will probably leave, um, unless I really like you and just want to hang out with you, I might stay. Um, But yeah, after being ignored and rejected, if you are going to insult me after that, I am for sure gone. I am not interested in uh, really pushing into that relationship. It probably will change our dynamic. I'm going to have to pray about it and try and forgive you, but I'm probably going to need some space if I am ignored, rejected, and insulted. So I think to myself, how did this woman do it? How did she keep pushing even through all of that? And I think it's important. I think she asked these two questions. The first question is, do I belong? Um... And this is a really important question. Belonging is such an important part of our relationship with God. Um, The benefits of belonging are safety, security, and stability. And when I started thinking about the idea of belonging, I thought about um, the places I belong. And the first thing that popped into my head was that I belong on the staff at Gateway, which means that during staff meeting on Mondays, I have a seat at the table, my opinions are welcome, Um, it is a safe place to disagree Um, And even sometimes for tension, because having all of us there means that we get to talk about how God is moving our church forward. And there is a sense of safety, there is security there, and there is stability there. And because of that, I belong. But could you imagine if you showed up to staff meeting uh, here at Gateway and just took my spot at the table? Like, that would be a really weird situation. Or imagine I showed up to your staff meeting at your job, or even like your family meeting where you're about to handle some serious family drama. It would be weird if I showed up because I don't belong there. Belonging is where we find safety, security, and stability. I think one of the most important pictures of belonging is a healthy marriage relationship. You get to know a person, you decide to make a commitment to belong to them the rest of your life. That means when things are hard. That means when you're not benefiting from them. That means when you are an absolute mess or even when things are going really well, you belong to that person. You are committed to being in relationship with them. And in that, we find safety and security and stability. I was um, in a bookstore the other day looking through, like a Christian bookstore. So naturally, I went to like the personality section because I just always really enjoy those books. And I found one on... Um, the five love languages. And if you're not familiar with that term, essentially there's five primary ways in which we um, express love and receive love. One of them is touch. And I opened that chapter and the very first thing it said was, do I belong? I said, interesting. 
I'm literally talking about that. That's one of my big points. And I looked and read about the connection between belonging and touch. And first service, uh, there was a family, and I watched a dad walk up to his two daughters and just threw his arm around them um, and, like, gave them a big hug and, like, played with them a little bit. And all I could think of it was that he, in that action, was saying, I love you, you belong. So I just want to encourage you guys, in this season of COVID where we don't hug and high-five and maybe, like, most physical contact is like an elbow bump, make sure you're hugging the people that you love um, because it is an actual physical symbol saying, I love you and you belong. And if we don't understand that we don't belong, we're not going to feel safe, we're not going to feel secure, and we're not going to feel stable. And we need to feel those things if we want to have meaningful relationships. So touch is really important. But back to the story. So we see that this woman probably asked the question, do I belong, and answered it correctly. That is how she confidently approached Jesus, as she understood that she belonged. Even if that meant under the table like the dog, she was welcome. The next question I think she asked was, can he do it? There were probably other relationships in her life that she belonged, but she understood that they were not capable of delivering the miracle that she needed for her daughter. Our confidence in Jesus is directly connected to how consistent and intimate our time with him is. I bet there's a lot of kids in this room that are confident that your mom is going to make sure you have food to eat, or your dad, or whoever you live with, um, but you have food to eat, you have clothes to wear, and you have water to drink. Like, most of the people listening are confident that those are going to be met by their parents. But I am almost positive that none of you are waking up tomorrow thinking, I bet Pastor Rachel is going to make sure that I have breakfast, and that I have clean clothes, and that I have water to drink. Because that's not my role in your life. We're not... Um, I'm not that consistently involved in your life, and I'm not that intimately involved in your life. Um, but you are confident in your parents because they are consistently involved and they are intimately involved. And what's interesting is we kind of approach Jesus differently. We understand that to be confident in someone, you have to be consistently involved and intimately involved, um, and then that produces confidence. But we aren't consistently involved with Jesus or intimately involved with Jesus, and we're frustrated when we're not confident in him. Um, but you might be asking, how, like, how does that relate to this story? This woman didn't know Jesus before then. And there's something interesting about desperate situations. And I think desperate situations fueled by faith produce confidence. This woman was absolutely desperate for Jesus to move in her life. And even though she didn't have an incredible track record of who Jesus was and the things that she had done, she had heard about him and she chose to have faith, believe that he could do what he says, what other people had said about him, and she went to him. And I think that's how she was able to handle being rejected and ignored and insulted. Is she understood that she belonged and she understood that Jesus could do it. And it's tricky when we think about the will of God because we want him to do it the way we think makes the most sense. And that sometimes isn't his plan. Even when, we see, when we're asking for good things, that may not be what Jesus is doing in that situation. And I think sometimes that shakes our confidence. But when our confidence is kind of weak, we're not really sure, lean into the fact that you know that you belong to a God who is completely good, completely in control, and completely for you. So those are the two questions I see this woman asking. Do I belong? Can he do it? And there's one more question I see asked by a character in the story that's not her. What question do the disciples ask? Um, we see them respond to this woman um, and it's kind of a, like, why did you respond that way? And I think it was because there were some underlying motives. And let me just preface with reading motives can be incredibly dangerous, but I really prayed about this, so I feel like this is what Jesus was saying. But I think the question they were asking was, what is my role? What's my role in this situation? And they totally got it wrong. They assumed that their role was acting like the gatekeepers for who was allowed to come to Jesus and who isn't. And maybe that was because of insecurity. Maybe they weren't sure Jesus was big enough for the both of them. But when we don't understand belonging and when we lack confidence in God's ability, we often confuse our role in his mission. So if we want to know what our role is in the big plan in God's kingdom and his redemptive story, we have to understand belonging and have a confidence that he can do it. And when I think about the disciples, maybe they sincerely didn't understand that Jesus could be present for them and this woman which, like, I feel like makes sense because Jesus was physically there with them, 
And like, if I'm talking to Pastor Ben, Pastor Bobby can't talk to Pastor Ben because I'm talking to Pastor Ben. And maybe there was kind of that dynamic going on. They really didn't understand how Jesus could be there. Or maybe they thought, maybe Jesus is going to love this woman more. She is kneeling at his feet, and I have not done that. I'm just here as his friend. So maybe there was some insecurity or just misunderstanding about who Jesus was. Um, Miss Mary, if you want to come play keys, that'd be cool. And I just wanted to help. I'm just going to verbally say this so we can make this mental shift. But we're going to shift from uh, me teaching to a time of experiencing God. So there's a lot going on in this story. Um, this woman handles, pushes through being ignored, being rejected, and being insulted. And Jesus does a miracle. And there's a few things that I think are incredibly important for us to know. And the first is that you belong. And for anyone here who has been hurt by the church, who has been told that you don't belong, who has been, like has had those experiences where the church has made them feel unwelcome or like you have to measure up to a standard or you have to perform a certain way or you have to look a certain way or be good enough, that is not the belonging that Jesus calls you to. There is nothing you can do to fit. You are already welcome. He has designed you to belong to him. When we feel like we don't belong, it's because we're distant from Jesus. So for my friends here who have been hurt by the church, I am so sorry. You have a seat at the table and you do not have to earn it. And when we think back to a marriage relationship and we see how intimately you can belong to a person, that is just a picture of how we belong to Jesus. Jesus is our source of belonging. That is the only place we can truly belong, the only place we are completely accepted. So you don't have to be married to understand what it means to intimately belong to Jesus. Because that is just a picture. It's a really good picture, but it's just a picture. You belong. The next thing we need to understand is that he can do it. Confidence comes from a long history of seeing Jesus correctly. I said correctly, that's important. Long-term Christians might doubt Jesus because they've looked at him in a very broken lens. So you may be here and you've served Jesus longer than I've been alive, but we're still fearful of asking him to do big things because we're not really sure he can do it. We doubt his character. We doubt his ability. I am here to tell you he can do it. That doesn't mean he will do it the way that you think he should do it, but that he can do it. And the last thing that I want you guys to remember is our role, our primary role, will always be to come to Jesus with faith and humility. We are not the gatekeepers. We do not get to hold people to our idea of a biblical standard. Jesus will always deal with me and my sin with me. And sometimes, yes, he might tell me something that I get to call out in another person. But in those moments, maybe just ask him for three things he's dealing with you in first. That one's really hard because it is so much easier to make the kingdom of God look like the way you want it to look like than to personally grow. Growth is really hard. But our role is always going to be to approach situations with humility. And some of us are sitting here thinking, man, I am really prideful. I try to impress people. I work really hard. I feel like I fall in that boat more often than not. And there's other of us who said, man, I have mastered humility. I am always willing to give someone else the stage. And sometimes even that comes out of insecurity because we doubt God's ability. Understanding our role in the mission of God is really tricky. And it's not something we say, Lord, would you show this to me? And then he tells you, and then you've got it figured out the rest of your life. It is a constant, Lord, remind me of how you want me to work in this situation. Lord, what are you trying to say through me to this person? Lord, how are you asking me to grow? When I think about these three facts, that I belong, that Jesus can do it, and that my role will always involve humility, my mind immediately goes to the belonging side of this. Um, I would say my growing up was rough. There's a lot of things that me and a good counselor have had to work through. Um, but oftentimes, I find myself being incredibly sensitive to like criticism 
I don't think there's anyone in this room that's like, I love being criticized. But when I um, am receiving criticism and I'm not in a super healthy place with the Lord, I immediately start doubting if that relationship is safe, if it's secure, if it's stable. And what seems to be like a small thing turns into this really big, do I belong here moment. Um, and I said first service, and I'll say again, but Pastor Ben, I'm just so thankful that you've been willing to, um, through just different staff things, be willing to have hard conversations and remind me that this is a safe place and that this is a stable relationship and that we can have secure conversations. Those relationships are incredibly important. Where you feel safe, where things are stable and when there is security. And sometimes there is not a person to find that in. But if we understand that people are just a representation of finding that in Jesus, we will be okay. I just want to invite you guys to stand and maybe close your eyes. I am confident that every single one of us will ask all three of these questions the rest of our life. Do I belong? Can Jesus do it? What is my role? But some of us might be asking that question to Jesus for the very first time today. Jesus, do I belong in relationship with you? Am I good enough to be in relationship with you? Have I worked hard enough to be in relationship with you? Can you handle all of my mess? And the simple answer is yes, he can. And yes, he will. And yes, he wants to. If you're here right now and you want to ask that question to Jesus for the very first time, I just want to invite you to raise your hand. Jesus, thank you that we can find belonging with you. That even though sin separated us from you, you made a way for us to be in relationship. A perfect God with a very broken person. Thank you for choosing me, for creating me, designing me to be in relationship with you, to belong to you. And thank you that there's no room for fear in that relationship because you are completely good and completely in control. Would you help me and my friends, maybe for the first time, surrender control? Help us to trust you, to take that confident first step in faith, saying, I want to be in relationship. I want to know you consistently, and I want to know you intimately. Thank you for not pushing us into that, but for simply inviting us to experience it. And for the rest of us, like I said, we will probably ask these three questions the rest of our lives. We're always going to ask, do we belong? We're always going to ask if he can do it because there's always going to be new situations where we need to see Jesus move. And oftentimes we're going to confuse our role in his mission. But it's not enough for me to just give you the words, you belong, he can do it, and your role is humility. We have to experience God answering those questions for ourselves. One of my favorite professors um, from my Bible college always explained scripture as an invitation to God. That an encounter with God doesn't start when we can recite a verse, but it it starts when we understand that understanding scripture is an invitation to experiencing God himself. And I just want to invite you guys right now to experience God for yourself. And some of you have been doing that for literally longer than I've been alive. Some of you may doubt that that's even a thing that we can do, like really sincerely experience God. And if you're in that boat, if you're not sure that that's something you can do, I just want to ask you to have faith like this woman. She was so desperate that her faith compelled her because she had nothing else to hold on to. So I'm going to stop talking for a second so Jesus can start talking to you. And I want you guys to ask these questions. Do I belong? Can he do it? And what's my role?
just thank you that you are the perfect place to bring our doubts. That when we're not sure if we belong, when we doubt your ability, and when we don't understand what our role in your story is, you are the perfect person to come to. And I pray we wouldn't just come to you in this moment with those questions but that we would create a pattern in our life of coming to you when we feel like we don't belong, when we're not sure about your ability, when we're not sure about what you're asking us to do in a situation. Help us to come to you. Help us to be people who are consistently and intimately involving you in our lives. And Lord, for people in this room, for the very first time, would you help them to understand that you are speaking to them and that it's not big and complicated and confusing, but you are close, you are consistent, you are safe, you are stable, you are secure. You are the very person you call us to lean into. Even when we feel like there's nowhere else to turn, you call us to lean into you. Would you help us do that? And would you help us correctly answer these questions and that we would know that we do belong and that you are capable and that we do fit into your story and you have specific plans for us, for the situations that we're facing. Thank you, Jesus. And as Pastor Ben says, I pray that you go before us and behind us and all around us. But not that you would just go but that we would see you. We would see you in front of us, dealing with the situations we're facing. We would see you behind us in our past and in our pain. And we would see you all around us, looking for the opportunities you're calling us to bring yourself into. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Man, my sincere hope is that this these three questions would last longer than today and in this moment, that we would constantly be asking uh, and evaluating how we belong. Because the more we look at that, the more we're going to see how deeply and intimately we belong to Jesus. And that we would be people who are constantly looking for moments of faith, asking if God can do it because he can. Sometimes we don't ask that question because we're not looking for opportunities for God to move. And I pray that that's not us, that we are people who invite God into our lives and to to see what he's willing to do and what he's trying to do in different situations. And help us know our role. Please don't be a Pharisee. If there's one thing you remember from the last three weeks, I want it to be don't be a Pharisee. Our role is always going to be humility. 